everyone, I'm Celeste. Welcome to my booktube channel, A Reader's Almanac. Well, last time around, I shared some of the books that I was planning on putting on my April nightstand, some lovely poetry collections and other sort of light springy books that I was really looking forward to browsing. Today, I'm going to be bringing you even more spring books. Uh, these are mainly novels. I think there may be one nonfiction choice in there as well, but these are classic novels overall, books that are perennially popular in the springtime that I see a lot of uh, people discussing on their channels. And I'm going to do it in this order. I'm going to first start out with the books that I've already finished. Then I'm going to discuss the books that I'm currently reading. And finally, I'm going to be sharing what to me are exciting plans for some books and topics I plan on covering in the upcoming videos. So let's get started. The first book that I would like to share with you is Lark Rise to Candleford by Flora Thompson. Now, Lark Rise to Candleford is Flora Thompson's tribute to the area she grew up in. It's semi-autobiographical, and she talks about sort of the vanished world of agricultural customs and traditions. Um, she was born in Juniper Hill, the hamlet in Oxfordshire, and this recaptures her youth and coming of age in the 1880s. And oh yeah, I was so looking forward to reading uh, Lark Rise to Candleford. Um, I've seen it praised so many times on booktube. Um, it really seems to be sort of the height of uh, cozy comfort cottagecore. And I normally love uh, agricultural memoir, stories about rural life that are fictionalized or biography. Um, but I think the problem that I had with this is that I was hoping for a narrative, a story that had a definite narrative arc, you know, a plot that reached a certain point and then resolves. And um, it's really not that. And that's nothing bad on Flora Thompson or on her uh, work. It's more my expectation, which was um, not realistic. This is um, really more a collection of loosely gathered, lovely memories that are sort of strung together or cobbled together. And it's really uh, charmingly written. Um, it does hark back to the simple uh, village life of the peasant and the craftsman of the late 1800s but uh, it was kind of hard to sustain my attention with this because um, you know after nine or ten of these memories strung together you sort of want something to start happening and um, so it is lovely writing uh, I did get on a lot better with the TV series and watched a number of episodes of that. It's beautifully filmed and the TV series, series does have more storyline, um, you know, so they're very quiet, sort of quaint, mirthful stories, um, beautifully filmed, uh, you know, it's very gorgeous, it's sort of sleepy. Um, and dreamlike and like a painting. It's painterly. Um, but in terms of being um, writing, I just did not hold my attention and so I confess I DNF'd it. Um, I did re read Lark Rise, uh, the first one, um, but there are actually three books in here. It's a trilogy. So I read Lark Rise, but there is also Over to Candleford and then Candleford Green. Um, so lovely writing, but just not enough of a storyline to really captivate me or hold my attention all the way through. The next book that I finished reading just last week is The House of Mirth by Edith Borden. And um, hmm, 
The House of Mirth is a novel that was written and published in 1905. It tells the story of Lily Bart, who was born into New York society in the late 1800s, but Lily becomes poor. Her parents have a reversal of fortune and soon they pass away. Um, and Lily must find a wealthy husband in order to maintain the lifestyle that she's grown accustomed to. Um, she not only wants to continue living the life of privilege that she's been living, but um, if she were to fall from grace through financial misfortune, she would become sort of the object of scandal. So um, this is a book about her in her social circles with the uh, um, uh, Gilded Age aristocracy of New York City and its environs. Um, and that's the way New York high society operated at the time with its etiquette and its manners and being in the in crowd or falling from grace and no longer being in the in crowd and becoming the object of scandal. Uh, so this goes through Lily's relationship with a number of different men. The men uh, love Lily. She's beautiful. Uh, she's unique, thus her name, Lily. Um, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with this book. If you watch my channel, you will know that I am a real Edith Wharton fan, um, but I do have kind of a love-hate relationship with this particular book. On the one hand, it has so many characters and social engagements and house parties and suitors for Lily that it does get to be a little bit confusing and uh, you start to lose the ability to keep score. And I found myself having to look up a guide to the characters so that I could keep track of who everybody was. Um, and it's definitely presented in the form of a two-act tragedy. You know how in the Gilded Age that um, the characters love to go to um, the Met or to the Opera House and um, watch theater and opera from their booths. Um, and it's kind of like that. It's kind of a tragedy in two acts. So it is kind of hard to keep track of all of Lily's social engagements and all of the men in her life. On the other hand, it does have Edith Wharton's absolutely gorgeous writing style. I just love her prose style, um, shot through with opulence. The depictions of house interiors are splendid. Edith Wharton actually uh, wrote a book about interior decoration, and it really shows in the House of Mirth. Her description is so rich about how the living rooms and the parlors are appointed with ferns and decorations and knickknacks and statues. Wharton also writes about um, a world which is uh, both gas and electric, so it's sort of on the cusp of one time period turning into another. Um, and she writes stunning fashion descriptions of the brilliant dresses that the women, including Lily, wear. Um, and as we know, Edith Wharton actually knew um, New York High Society and um, these characters from the Gilded Age, um, and she parleyed with the New Yorkers of the time, and she also went to Europe. Um, so I really did enjoy this. I wouldn't say it's the easiest book to read. Um, it does require your full alertness to keep track of everybody and everything that's going on. Um, but it was definitely worthwhile reading. And I had decided to read this book now because ever since watching The Gilded Age, I've become so interested in Gilded Age society and that time period. In fact, I've really sort of pinpointed it down um, that I'm really just sort of in love with um, the years from about 1870 to about 1920. And so that would encompass the Gilded Age and then um, the Edwardians 
um, the World War One era and then just right after World War One. So um, yeah, that is a world I'm very, very much interested in and will bringing you, be bringing you a lot more content on um, and really reading a lot more from authors who lived during this time period. The reason I decided to do a read through of this now other than re-watching The Gilded Age is because of a suggestion from the uh, booktuber Olive from A Book Olive. And uh, she recently read a book which looks like such a fun romp and that is The Wharton Plot. And I would like to read that as well in the fall going into winter. And um, because it looks like it takes place in the winter time. And it's about Edith Wharton as a detective solving a mystery. And in the book she's also writing and the time period she's writing in is after she's been writing The House of Mirth and right before she goes into writing The Custom of the Country. So my plan is to have read The House of Mirth again, which I just did, and then sometime in the summer or early fall, I will tackle The Custom of the Country, and then as winter approaches, I'll be reading The Wharton Plot. Um, it just sounded like a really neat reading challenge, and I love Edith Wharton, I love The Gilded Age. Um, I think she's just a marvelous American writer. And uh, so I had a lot of fun with this, even though I found it challenging as a classic. So now let's move to some books that I'm reading now. Um, what I'm reading currently, and I'm almost finished with it, is a wonderful book. And I actually have two editions of it here to share with you. <clears throat> it is called Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch, and it is by Alice Caldwell Hagen. And this was written in 1901. Now I have another edition of this book that I remember from my own childhood. This is an earlier vintage edition, but I also have this one, which I read when I was little. And this is Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch. On this one it says by Alice Hegan Rice. So it includes her married name. And this is a, a Whitman edition. I love this cover that shows the Cabbage Patch. Um, yeah, this book is really, really special. Um, Alice Hegan Rice, I'm just going to look at my notes here. Um, she was born in 1870 in Shelbyville, Kentucky, and uh, she did have a relatively privileged upbringing, but her views on life changed when she went to a mission school um, on Sundays, and that was in a local slum in Louisville called the Cabbage Patch. The mission was interrupted by a group of troublesome boys, but luckily Rice was able to diffuse the situation by entertaining them with a story she had just read. For the rest of the mission, she continued to tell them crazy stories about gangsters and pirates, and the boys came to know and love her. This experience introduced her to the world of poverty and the underprivileged. She would later use this newfound knowledge to influence her most widely known novel, Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch. So she became part of a social movement that would help improve the work and living conditions of the poor. And in fact, Alice Caldwell Hagen, or Alice Hagen Rice, founded the Cabbage Patch Settlement House in Louisville in 1910. So it's really an interesting little book. Um, I find it strange that it's considered a children's book when you think about what it's about. Um, so Mrs. Wiggs has three daughters, which she has named after European continents, um, and she has two sons, one of who is ill. And um, this tells about her adventures living in the Cabbage Patch, which is a very impoverished area. Her husband has died of alcoholism, and she's been left to raise five children single-handedly. Um, there's also sort of a subplot, which is a love story involving two um, well-off socialites who want to help Mrs. Wiggs and her family. Um, but anyways, it's a very special book. It's a quick read. I'm almost finished with it. And this edition in particular 
is very near and dear to me because it's the one I remember being on our uh, bookshelf as children. So Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch. Another book that I've been enjoying this month is a reread of Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery, a perennial spring favorite, and I've seen it making the rounds again on all of the cozy booktube channels. L.M. Montgomery has always been a favorite of mine since I was a little girl. My first exposure to Anne of Green Gables was actually when I went over to my friend Patsy's house and uh, after school one day, and we we went up to her room and on her shelves, and I remember her bedroom was always so spotlessly clean and neat, um, and um, kind of like Marilla would have Anne's room, right? Uh, but anyway, I went over there, and of course, when you're friends with somebody as a child, you're interested in what books they have on their bookshelf. And she had the whole set of Anne of Green Gables, and it just got me so excited about reading those books, and I had to go home and tell my mother that I wanted my own copies of the books. And there are so many great editions of Anne of Green Gables, too. I think Patsy had hardcovers, I'm not sure. But anyway, that was the beginning of my love of Anne of Green Gables and L.M. Montgomery. So I've really been enjoying this reread and the world that it evokes um, is just marvelous. And I have many editions of Anne of Green Gables. I also recently uh, acquired new copies of the Junior Illustrated Library editions. They did the first three books of the Anne books, um, and I just love the spines. I love the cover art on these. I'll show you uh, the inside front piece illustration on this as well. If I can get it open, here we go. They're just really dear. And um, one thing that's very exciting this summer is that they are doing a 150 year celebration of L.M. Montgomery uh, up in Canada, in Toronto and in the surrounding areas. L.M. Montgomery lived in several places. Um, so um, there is an L.M. Montgomery house in Toronto and, and there's what, so one, just outside, I believe, of the city. And I'm actually considering maybe going up for that, for their celebration. Um, and they have a bookstore there and all of that. So I may do that because I'm only about three hours from Toronto, but we'll see. And then recently, I've also been enjoying a reread of The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Here is my edition of this. I just love these illustrations by Graham Rust. They're beautiful. Uh, they're very Tasha Tudor-esque in my opinion. And I just love how he evoked the world of uh, Mary and Colin and Dickon. Um, this is again a perennial favorite. Um, Frances Hodgson Burnett was another writer that fits into that sort of late 1800s, turn of the century, early 1900s world. And um, the language in this is just so evocative of spring. I'll be talking a lot more about The Secret Garden in a video next week. Um, this week I'm actually going to be attending a book club meeting where we'll be discussing The Secret Garden, and I'm very excited about that. That takes place this Wednesday on Zoom, so I'm really looking forward to that. And then additionally I'm going to be doing a reread of uh, Anne Thwaites' biography of Frances Hodgson Burnett, and that is called Beyond the Secret Garden. I first learned about this book back in, I think, 2021. I had gotten it out of my library, and um, I have a lot of thoughts about Frances Hodgson Burnett and about the secret garden. It's kind of a, a not a love-hate relationship, but I love it overall, like 99.9%. .9%. I do find a little of it problematic. I may go into that in my next video, or maybe not, I don't know. But I'm really looking forward to this discussion on Wednesday. It's going to prove to be very special. And um, yeah, and then finally, 
just because I was reading on the topic of India, which is where Mary used to live before she came to Misselthwaite Manor in the Secret Garden, um, I wanted to read something that was set in India, starring a strong Indian female character. And uh, what channel was it on that I saw this? Kate Howe. Uh, Kate Howe gave us this recommendation in one of her videos. And so I've just started The Widows of Malabar Hill, a 1920s mystery set in India. And this is the deluxe edition. This is by Sujata Massey. And um, I believe Sujata Massey has one parent who was Indian and the other may have been German but she grew up in Britain. But anyways, she's written maybe three or four uh, mystery novels uh, starring a character called Praveen Mystery. Uh, she is the daughter of a uh, respected Zoroastrian family, and she has just joined her father's law firm. Armed with a legal education from Oxford, Praveen also has a tragic personal history that makes women's legal rights especially important to her. And I figured as uh, the weather sort of warms up, the evocation of 1920s India um, just sounds absolutely marvelous to me. And um, yeah, I don't think this is a TV series at this point, but um, in any event, it sounds like it should be. So far, it's very cinematic. I'm only, I would say, four chapters into this, and so far, I really, really am enjoying it. Well, that's everything I have for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm really looking forward to doing more videos on uh, some classic literature and history as well that falls between 1870 and the first part of the 20th century up past World War I. And um, I'll be doing further reading of Edith Wharton, um, of L.M. Montgomery, of the Gilded Age, of uh, Frances Hodgson Burnett, and many other things as well. I hope you're enjoying your spring. I'm about to get out there and take a walk. Um, our cherry blossom in the front has blossomed and the bees are gathering all around it and already pollinating it. Um, it just came into bloom overnight and they're already all crowded around it, pollinating it, which is really neat. So um, spring has definitely arrived and I hope you're enjoying it and we'll see you again real soon. Bye bye.